Señoras y señores, embajadores, querido público, queridos amigos, la segunda edición del Festival Isla de Literatura es hoy una realidad. Muchísimas gracias a todos por compartir con nosotros este momento. Por segundo año consecutivo, Irlanda, Latinoamérica y España se dan la mano en estos tres días de mesas redondas, lecturas y otros actos relacionados con la literatura. El Festival Isla, una iniciativa del Instituto Cervantes de Dublín que hace apenas dos años parecía descabellada, es posible hoy, una vez más, gracias al trabajo tenaz de las embajadas de Argentina, Chile, Cuba, México y de la propia Embajada de España, de la que este Instituto Cervantes forma parte. Un festival que se hace grande gracias al apoyo y la colaboración de instituciones como Dublin UNESCO City of Literature, Ireland Literature Exchange, el Instituto Vasco Echepare, Foras Nagelga, Poetry Island y, como no, a la inestimable aportación de Dublin City University, National University of Ireland in Galway, National University of Ireland in Maynooth, Trinity College Dublin y University College Cork. Muchísimas gracias a todos ellos. Tenía que ser aquí, en esta isla esmeralda donde naciera y creciera nuestro festival, donde la semilla de nuestro esfuerzo diera sus frutos, en esta misma tierra donde tantos genios de la literatura cavaron antes con su pluma para fecundarla y enriquecerla, para hacerla abierta, acogedora y libre. Porque la gran riqueza de Irlanda es su cultura y su maravillosa tradición literaria. Y esa poderosa fuerza se da hoy la mano aquí en este festival con la fuerza del español, con 500 millones de seres humanos en cuatro continentes, con la segunda lengua de comunicación a nivel internacional de la que, sin embargo, apenas se traduce al inglés cada año 80 o 90 títulos. Por ello, nuestro Festival Isla se presenta hoy, una vez más, como un espacio para el intercambio, para la comunicación, para la lectura y el conocimiento mutuo. Con él, como dijera el presidente Michael D. Higgins, los organizadores continuamos y profundizamos nuestro compromiso con la cultura y la literatura irlandesa creando vínculos para que nuestras dos tradiciones sigan influyéndose y enriqueciéndose mutuamente. Así sea, en esta isla fértil donde otros cavaron con su pluma, comenzamos a cavar nosotros hoy de nuevo con la segunda edición de nuestro festival, con 16 autores de Argentina, Chile, Cuba, Irlanda, México y España, con 16 creadores que nos ofrecerán a lo largo de estos días su poesía, su imaginación, y sus reflexiones acerca de la escritura y sus alrededores. En su discurso, Michael D. Higgins también citó a nuestro querido Simus Heaney. Todos deseábamos que él estuviera hoy con nosotros, pero no ha podido ser. Se nos fue a finales de agosto y a finales de agosto hemos querido recordarlo en nuestro programa, recogiendo zarzamoras tras la lluvia. Aquí seguimos, Simus, como niños insaciables manchándonos la lengua con tus versos, con los mismos versos que tú habías elegido para leer en nuestro festival y que hoy podremos escuchar en la voz de nuestro querido y entrañable amigo y gran actor, Tom Hickey. Será otro gran amigo de Simus y del Instituto Cervantes, John Banville, a quien en unos instantes cederé la palabra, quien abra oficialmente este festival, un magnífico escritor, bien conocido de todos ustedes y una magnífica persona que de forma amabilísima y desinteresadamente atendió nuestra llamada para cubrir tan importante ausencia. Muchísimas gracias, John, por tu generosidad. Simus, estés donde estés, este es también tu festival. Señoras y señores, aquí comienza el Festival Isla de Literatura 2013, el festival de todos ustedes. Bienvenidos. Uh. Good afternoon. Uh, well, in fact, it isn't a good afternoon. We should devise a, a way of greeting each other on days like this. Um, I would really rather not be here. Um, as you know, Seamus was to, to open the festival. And uh, now he won't. Uh, he was a dear friend of mine. I didn't quite realize how dear he was until he was gone. Uh, which is often the case. But I saw him a few times before he did go, and I was, I was glad that we, we made up for old disputes that we had way back in the 60s. Uh, he was, as I say, a dear man, a great poet. I was in uh, Spain recently, and uh, did you hear anything of what I've said so far? 
Dead, good. Um, I was in Spain recently, and everywhere I went, uh, people spoke of Seamus. Uh, and again, they spoke, first of all, with warmth about him, uh, and secondarily about his work. Um, I doubt that would be the case when I go. Um, he was, a, uh, uh, in the best sense of the word, he was a truly sweet man, and I loved him dearly, and I miss him. Um, I am not any kind of expert on Spanish or Latin American literature, um, but then I comfort myself with the fact that I don't think Seamus was either. Uh, of course, I've read uh, your authors. Uh, I stand in awe before the extraordinary tradition. The whole thing began, you know, fiction began with Cervantes, really. Um, I was thinking today as I walked up here through the rain, my first visit to Spain, which was before many of you were born, uh, back in the early 60s, and I went to Ibiza, because I'd heard that it was a very exciting place. And uh, on my first day there, I went to San Antonio, where I was told there was a wonderful beach. And the first thing I saw in the town of San Antonio was a cafe with a sign over it saying, tea like mum makes it. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, is this what I've come all this way for? <laughs> I was glad to discover that I was wrong. Uh, that Spain was far more than tea like mum made it. It was far more than Ibiza, in fact. Uh, my holiday only began at the end when I went to Barcelona and then I took the train, I took the Talgo, which I couldn't afford, but I took it anyway, up to Madrid. And halfway in that long journey, the train stopped, as trains do, for no reason, whatever, that I could think of, in the middle of, literally in the middle of nowhere. And I looked across the plain across a yellow field stretching into the distance. And there was a man on a horse riding away. And I thought, yes, you know, I've, now I've arrived in Spain. The odd thing about this memory is that even though it's very, very clear to me, it's both, sometimes it's a photograph and sometimes it's a negative because it's either a man dressed in black on a white horse or a man dressed in white on a black horse. I can't remember which it was. But it was Spain for me. Uh, and I. You know, you need to go to a country to have some idea of, of what its people and what its literature is about. I was on the Arts Council in the 1980s, and I spent all my time there trying to get bursaries for writers to leave the country, to go away from this little island and see that there is a wider world. My experiences in Latin America are very limited. Uh, in South America, I went to Mexico, but then I went to Oaxaca, which everybody tells me is not Mexico, but I loved it anyway. And then uh, earlier this year, I went to Brazil. It was my second visit. And uh, I was in Paraty uh, at the festival there. And one afternoon, I was taken on a boat across t to Thomas Mann's mother's house, her birthplace, uh, where I picked up breadfruit from the ground. And at last, I discovered what breadfruit is. Not a very exciting looking fruit, but at least I now know what it is. But it seemed extraordinary to me to be in South America and visiting the house of Thomas Mann's mother. Uh, it spoke to me of, you know, I would now fall into cliches, but the universality of, of literature and indeed the universality of culture. Uh, I remember meeting uh, Alberto Maravia here very late in his life. He was visiting Dublin and he said that he was still writing travel pieces for Corriere de, Corriere de la Sera. And he said, they always ask me, what's the food like? You have to say what the food is like in the countries you go to. And he says, every time, right, the food all tastes like beef, all tastes like beef. That's the downside of uh, globalization, of universality. Uh, to a certain extent, everything does taste like beef now. All the same, it's extraordinary, as I say, for me. I still remember that man on that horse from 40, what, some years ago. Uh, and I, as I say, I was thrilled to discover what breadfruit were in the house of Thomas Mann's mother. So I'm going to declare this festival open. Every time I'm asked to do a launch, I remember a wonderful piece of newsreel that I saw once from the Harlan and Wolf shipyard in Belfast, taken black and white, grainy black and white. An enormous ship was going down the slipway to be launched after it had its bottle of champagne broken on it. And it just kept going and going and going and going and going and sank. And I think, so I'm always loath to do a launch. 
but I have absolutely no doubt that this one will float buoyantly. May Seamus rest easy. This is Landmore's sonnet. I used to lie with an ear to the line, for that way they said there should come a sound escaping ahead, an iron tune of flange and piston pitched along the ground. But I never heard that. Always instead, struck couplings and shuntings two miles away, lifted over the woods. The head of a horse swirled back from a gate, a great turnover of haunch and mane. And I'd look up to the cutting where she'd soon appear. Two fields back in the house, small ripples shook silently across our drinking water, as they are now shaking across my heart and vanished into where they seemed to start. clearances. When all the others were away at mass, I was all hers as we peeled potatoes. They broke the silence, let fall one by one, like solder weeping off the soldering iron. Cold comfort set between us, things to share gleaming in a bucket of clean water, and again let fall. Little pleasant splashes from each other's work would bring us to our senses. So while the parish priest at her bedside went hammer and tongs at the prayers for the dying, and some were responding and some crying, I remembered her head bent towards my head, her breath in mine, our fluent dipping knives, never closer the whole rest of our lives. This one is called the skylight. You were the one for skylights. I oppose cutting into the seasoned tongue and groove of pitch pine. I liked it low and closed, its claustrophobic nest up in the roof effect. I liked the snuff dry feeling, the perfect trunk lid fit of the old ceiling. Under there, it was all hutch and hatch. The blue slates kept the heat like midnight thatch. But when the slates came off, extravagant sky entered and held surprise wide open. For days I felt like an inhabitant of that house where the man sick of the palsy was lowered through the roof, had his sins forgiven, was healed, took up his bed and walked away. Thank you. <laughs> 